So I'm Matt Tassaro. Um, I'm uh, uh, the CTO of Infinitive. I also work at Pearson. Um, I have a talk here called Taking AppSec to 11. And it's going to be a talk about how, um, and this is actually ironic, and there's a good sort of silver lining to some badness that happened this time last year. This time last year, I had a death in the family. I had to cancel my presentation. Um, and I was going to say you should do this. And this year, uh, there wasn't a death in the family. I'm here. And I can say, I did this, and here's the results. So a little bit of silver lining. I realized this last night. This is kind of cool. I'm not going to tell you that you should do this. It'll work. I can say, I did this, and this is how it worked for me. I still think you should do it. Um, but at least now I have some numbers. So let's talk about getting things to 11. So anybody know who this guy is? Ford, Ford yes. Henry Ford, right? He was the guy who said, you know what? This handcrafting car thing is kind of cool. Everybody likes a handcrafted car, but we can't really make a lot of them. And that sounds to me a lot like AppSec, right? This handcrafted testing is cool, and it's very thorough, and it's awesome. I've done lots of it, and it's very productive. But it's slow, and it doesn't scale at all. And uh, at Pearson, we have, I don't know, the numbers are very fuzzy, somewhere between 1,200 and 2,000 apps and about 5,000 developers. And right now we have 10 AppSec people, right? So those numbers don't argue for handcrafting, right? In fact, they'd say you can't bespoke anything. We need to get out of that, out of that business. So I want to talk about how you can take your application security program and apply DevOps, Agile, that kind of thinking to it and get an, a basically a... Uh, uh, assembly line into your AppSec program and really start churning out some numbers, hopefully. It's what I did at Pearson, and it's been, I think, very successful. We're kind of the golden children of the CISO group, which is nice. Um, so this is how we're going to take our AppSec and get it to 11. I had to use the Spinal Tap reference. That just is, it's, you can't not have the Spinal Tap. Do everybody know the Spinal Tap reference, please? Oh, good. Yay. I'm getting older. I had an intern when I was at Rackspace who had been alive shorter than my marriage. <laughs> Granted, I got married at 22. I got married pretty young, but it was still like, OMG, this is why all of my references, you just don't get, you kind of like this polite laugh, ha ha. Oh. So, <laughs> luckily this one worked. Hallelujah. Another strong recommendation, if you haven't done it already, go out and buy this book and read it. One, it will annoy you. I actually recommended this at another conference, and, and somebody came up to me on the second day and said, I got no sleep last night, you expletive. I Amazon that book, and I started reading it, and I didn't go to bed till 3. And I was like, dude, I, I'm sorry. So don't get this when the conference is over and start reading it. I did that. I stayed up too late reading it. It's a fantastic book. Great, great, great book. Can't recommend it enough. But I took some of the stuff I read in this book and some other things just in my life and tried to wrap them into what we did at, at uh, Pearson. Oh, the other thing this book talks about is the three ways of DevOps. They'll, they'll go through this guy's. It's a fictional the story of this guy's uh, work with IT and how he did DevOps and kind of change from a very dysfunctional uh, IT operations uh, situation to a very functional one. And in this path, he kind of, there's this kind of this Zen Buddha guy who helps him. And they talk about these three ways of DevOps. So I'm going to talk about the three ways of DevOps and how they relate to application security. So the first one is workflow. Um, and this is just crit like critically, it's looking at your purpose and what you serve for your business and how to do it like the best. What processes, what do you do that actually aids your reason for the business paying your salary? Right? That's your workflow. Um, and the other thing that, that I'll just as a little bit background of DevOps, the other thing they talk about is uh, working from left to right, working from the business through development to ops to finally a customer that's working left to right. And then the flow, where the flow rate, you'll hear talked about in a lot of DevOps talky uh, stuff. That's the speed at which you can move things from a business idea all the way out to a customer, right? That's the flow. So if, if I use these terms, I want to make sure I sort of level set before we get too deep into it. So workflow, this is that first of the three ways. Um, and there's sort of three key concepts around that. Each step needs to be repeatable, right? You want each step to almost be its easy button, right? To use another cliche, you want an easy button. The way we do a pen test is like this, kaboom, done. Consistent. Never pass on defects. For AppSec, defects are false positives, right? If you are simply running, you know, God help you, Scanner X, and printing a PDF and handing it off, you're just begging to be automated with some scripting, right? And I'm not sure your value add is to the business, right? Like, I could probably teach my, well, now he's 12-year-old son, to click next four times and print a PDF. Like, this is not really value add for a business. And then local optimizations with the global view, right? You have to make sure that what you're fixing, this is more particular when you're working on the uh, workflow of your group, and, that, and your group being, in my case, the AppSec team at Pearson. You have to look at that workflow and understand that you can't 
fix something that then buries another part of the process, right? You need to make sure that when you speed up individual things, and I'll talk through this with more specific examples, but when you're speeding up particular things, they can't then bury, they will, you'll inevitably be pushing bottlenecks around, right? You'll fix one bottleneck, you'll find the next one, but you have to have a global view, right? You cannot go so fast that you bury some other part of the business. So let's talk about AppSec pipelines and figure out your workflow. What we really want is we want custom but fast. That's really what we want. And everyone's probably been to Chipotle or a Chipotle equivalent, and that is pretty much custom but fast, right? You have a limited menu selection, but you can kind of mix and match a la carte, and you end up with the burrito or your bowl or whatever you want of your choice, right? This is what we want for AppSec, right? We want to be able to go down and start at the line and say, well, this app is kind of this much risky and it's kind of this important to the business and it has this much users, so they need this, 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 but they don't need that and I want extra guacamole, right? Whatever. Right? We need to be able to do that for AppSec. So I, my solution for this is what I'm calling an AppSec pipeline. In particular for Pearson, we really concentrated on making the AppSec team as functional as possible. Um, we are just now getting to where we're integrating more with external teams in year two. Because honestly, year one, we had, didn't have our house in order, so it was much more important for me to get our house in order before I started to try to interact with external bits of Pearson. So this was really focused at making our AppSec group lean, mean, and functional. So here's an example of an AppSec pipeline, the one that we implemented at Pearson. So we have AppSec requests coming in. There's a request process you send to a particular email address in our case. It goes into this app and services request repository. Um, this is what I tend to call the intake position. And then you have a triage, right? You're having requests coming in. I need to figure out what to do with them. That's the triage where we're using some orchestration. Oh, this is actually a generic one. Orchestration, in our case, we're using Stackstorm. We might provision some particular security services. You might kick off a threat model if it's of a high enough risk. You may do manual assessments. You'll have some kind of collection. I think I have a, do I have a laser pointer on this thing. Yes, I do. Ooh, look. You have some kind of collection of security tools you're going to automate in the middle and run those and gather results. You'll want to dump those into some sort of central rise, centralized repository to keep track of all of the results in one single place so you have one source of truth. Hopefully, you're going to push those out to a defect tracker um, and if we're all lucky, someday we'll live in a perfect world where reporting is dead and we just do bugs. Because right, for AppSec, I think that's what they should be. That's how devs talk, it's a bug. Granted, it's a security bug. I hate writing reports. I have no problem doing bug trackers or issues and issue trackers. Um, but also from the same single source of truth, you can pump out metrics, you can talk to GRC tools like uh, RSA Archer or whatever you want, right? And that's what we kind of call the deliver. And while we worked through this process in 2015, we sort of started, we actually started on the, on the intake and the uh, deliver portion of it first and worked on kind of the end um, and then just kept iterating, right? We started really with our first release in March. So let's talk about key features of an AppSec pipeline if you're gonna do this thing. It is definitely designed for iterative improvement like I just mentioned. It's never done, it's always made better. We always find that one thing that's a bit of a paper cut, let's fix that. Oh no, this thing is slow, let's fix that. We're burning too much time there, let's fix there. Right, you just keep going and it's never really done. But it does provide, I think this is a crucial thing, a reusable path for AppSec activities, right? As we're talking about where AppX is in this pipeline, we have really well-known defined states. So it's really easy to kind of understand across the team in particular, and even now where it's getting out outside of our team within Pearson, of where apps are. Oh, you're in this stage, you're in this state. And now it's kind of become a common vernacular where we can speak uh, clearly about what's going on. It does provide a, a clear and consistent process for the team and our constituency, much like that thing I just said. If you understand the states that these apps are gonna go in as you go from left to right, now our constituency is starting to actually talk back to us in that same language. Like the dev managers are saying, oh, I'm here, okay, great. We both know and there's this common language, which has been huge. We have a one-way flow with well-defined states. We don't ever sort of go backwards, right? You just go through the system. If we need to do a retest, we start over. And we start at the beginning, we take an intake, and we push them through again, right? There's no sort of uh, stopping the factory lines. Well, there sort of is, but not really. Um, we are relying heavily on automation. I'll talk through a bunch of ways that we're doing that. We've grown this organically over time, and the ideal goal is to gracefully in in 
gracefully interconnect with the dev process. So in our case, that's primarily JIRA, although if you guys have more than one app team, you probably have more than one bloody issue tracker. Um, it's primarily JIRA, although we have some others that we're now working on integrating with. So when we have a finding, we'll bundle one or more findings together and make a, a security bug in JIRA for the teams, right? That's how we do reporting, and that's how we're integrating with the teams. We actually have numbers. I don't think I put them in here. What was it? It was a 40% decrease in time to fix for those apps that we have JIRA integration with versus still doing the traditional PDF, God, I'll help you reporting. So we just saw market increase because I, I, saw, I used to be a developer. You hand me a 100-page PDF, I'm going to go, that's cute. I'm going to drop it somewhere and I'm going to move on. Like, I don't want to read that thing. I don't want to understand that thing, right? It's just a mess. So like, where we've killed that, that ugliness, it's actually been significantly productive. Ah, here's our actual one. So this is what we have at Pearson. That other one was a generic slide. I, I misspoke earlier. So we have incoming service requests. We wrote an open sourced app, a Django-based app called Bag of Holding. You can go get it off of GitHub. I think I have a link later. Um, that is basically our where we track all the incoming activities, who's on what. We assign stuff. We know how many engagements we have in, going on. Uh, for Pearson, the idea of an engagement is a bucket to hold one or more security activities. So that could be you're getting a manual assessment and a uh, app scan, and we're running check marks against you, or whatever it is, right? Those all get put into a bucket of an engagement, and we track them there. We're using Stackstorm to do a bunch of orchestration. I'll have some examples of this in a few slides. From there, we're going to our Slate O tools, where we have check marks, Veracode. We use Burp Suite, Zap, White Hat, um, IBM's uh, app scan, and then Qualys. I have had some people ask, like, why so many tools? Well, some of them, like for Qualys, there's a different department that actually paid for Qualys, and they have their web application scanner, their WAS thing, so why not? We'll take those feeds in, right? We didn't buy it, people are running it, we can grab those feeds off of it and stick it into ThreadFix, which is our one source of truth. Why not have that extra information? So that's what we do. Um, and then ThreadFix, like I just mentioned, that's our single source of truth, right? A vulnerability doesn't exist at Pearson unless it's in ThreadFix. And everything we do, even manual assessments, all end up in ThreadFix. Why? Well, one, like I said, we have a single source of truth. But more importantly, I can pull metrics consistently for all of our apps from that one place. We can push things into JIRA. We can kill false positives. All that stuff happens in ThreadFix. And once we get Archer actually working, we'll push stuff into Archer too. That's somebody else's problem. I don't have to get it working. Yeah, sure. Ah, got you. Um, yes, in some cases. We're not perfect with that. That's, that's actually an area we're trying to improve this year. Um, if we're manually closing them and the person who closes them has their smart hat on, they will go back and, you know, tweak a, uh, like a check marks profile for doing a scan. Um, that's mostly how we're doing them now. Like when we onboard people with check marks, uh, that's, this is a good example actually. When we onboard people with check marks, we will run an initial scan with them with a kind of a high touch scan, right? Run the first scan, look at it, we'll review it, kill some false positives, tweak that scan profile and get a reasonable scan profile. Um, we actually don't hold the application owners responsible for the check marks findings until they get to where they're going to do like what would be like UA or, or pre-prod work, but we set them up when they start. So you have this sort of window of time between when we set up uh, check marks and when we're actually UA or pre-prod that they can run it as much as they want. They're getting results. We're filtering false positives. Um, and that gives them a way to sort of warm up and for us, honestly, to have the, the lead time to run a couple scans and tune them significantly, or, you know, tune them as best we can, right, to get rid of those false positives. We'll mark them in thread fix if they've made it through. The thing where we're hurting is we don't have a good way to capture those marked as false positive and check marks were from scanner app scan, let's say, and then to flag who did that scan and then tell them, go make this setting to that app. You, if you get what I'm saying, that is the gap that we're trying to close this year. So it's if basically if people remember to do it, it gets done. <laughs> and I don't trust people to remember to do it. So we're working on being able to pull metrics out of ThreadFix to say, hey, we took a false positive on this app using this scanner, and this guy did it or gal did it. Now let's go back and have them adjust the profile. We don't have that yet. That's what we're working towards. Does that make sense? Yeah, and more does make that to Veracode, which is strictly SaaS solution. So we're finding 
things that are reported in code base, let's say you fix uh, 10 findings or flag them as false positives or issues like that. Yep. It, it's just like it doesn't make that. Veracode will still report that every time, those 10 findings. But because of the yeah, the steady controls. Yeah, the, the way that you really fix that is to fix the, the policy, the scan policies, right? To, like you would go into Veracode and say, this is a false positive. Don't report it for this app anymore. Um, and we do that when we remember, uh, to be honest with you. That's where we are now. I'm trying to get it so where we can find when we don't remember and start pointing fingers. And that's what we don't have. So it's, it's hit or miss now, to be totally honest with you. Uh, we're, I'd say we're pretty good about it because we usually do a lot of hand-holding, particularly with the static because it's noisy um, at first. So those false positives get kind of uh, ferreted out in that initial, like, let's set up a first scan. Let's look at them. Are they saying, no, we got these things are ridiculous. Let's turn those off. Usually those, those profiles, the scanner profiles, get tweaked pretty well there. Where we're really missing it is in some of the dynamic stuff like app scan. Getting that profile down and, and sort of hardened and good is tricky. Right, I saw another question. Yeah. How many thousand users Whoa. Uh, we have 2,000 apps. That answer is everywhere from like once a week to every six months to twice a year. I mean, it's, it is so all over the place. I, don't, I, I hate to answer that question. Well, yes, there's one in HE that does that that's based in Amazon. Yeah, they're, they're a very aggressive dev app shop. So they're probably, I don't, I don't remember their numbers because I don't actually work directly with them. But they're in that a couple times a week range, yes. It gets very tight. Yeah, and for those, I had more of those actually when I worked at Rackspace. And for those, a lot of times we would set up uh, this idea of like the uh, a, a cadence of a scan. And they may, may, they may put, make three pushes to prod in between our window of being able to look and tell. Yes, exactly. Exactly, yep. And then we just kind of try to tie it up as best we can with them. And maybe they do three p pushes to prod before we get back with them, but that's just how it works. Yeah. And at least if they're pushing that quick, the fixes go quick too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we actually had one at Rack that was amazing. We, we, th this guy was doing a test. He was on IRC with the, the, the dudes that were on this one project, and he found an issue. He said, hey, I found an issue. Here's proof. Great. Um, he keeps testing. Ding on IRC. Hey, it's fixed. He's like, what? He's, yeah, push to fix to prod. I'm like, okay, retest. Yeah, it's gone. So we open and close that bug. So before we even finish the engagement, like, it was done and patched. So it, it, it depends. Right, if they do a hot fix or something, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yes, another question. So, where are your developers engaging? Are they engaging with Jira, or are they logging in with Netflix, or are they actually going to AppSec, or are they the bank of holding? Qualtrics and saying, hey, what's going on in Jira? Mostly, right now, we're interacting with the developers through Jira. So you're creating tickets for everyone in two months. Yes, I mean, with some sanity, we can. ThreadFix gives you the ability to take these 10 cross-site scriptings and push them as one, hey, fix cross-site scripting in this thing. So you can kind of group individual findings to make sense. So if you find 10 things, that doesn't necessarily relate to 10 bugs. But yeah, we, that's, that's the right now our window with um, developers. We're this year working on actually getting into more build pipelines. Um, and I'll show an example of that in a, in a slide or two. So does your interface two ways? It pulls it out? Yes. Yeah, ThreadFix has a scheduled job that happens at 2 a.m. or something like that that looks at all of its known JIRA issues and ch sees for a change in status. That one was open yesterday. Oop, it's closed today. I'll mark it closed here. And now we can detect that change in ThreadFix and schedule a retest if it's warranted or what, whatever. Yep, yes? So for an enterprise level, uh, what is your release management or change management control and, and or sign off here? Is it through JIRA or you have another system like C Oh. There is a whole CMDB that's a separate group um, that we interface with. And we're right now just beginning getting that interface sane. To be quite honest with you, they do stuff via email, and we hate email. And I think we've beat them enough that they're going to API-ify it. So once I have an API that I would, I'm happy to work with it. Right now, we would like gather up emails and ship them to them. These are the end things that had these problems. And you know we just auto-gen emails, which is awful. <laughs> but that's what we got right now. Unfortunately, we don't control those that are not in our group. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you're going to give me an email interface, I'll send you an email, but I'm not going to like it. Oh, perfect. So this is how we're interacting with some of the dev teams a little bit now. It could be Gauntlet. It could be anything you want. 
right, as part of their normal DevOps build pipeline, we're this year in particular starting to wire in tests into their build pipelines that are particularly my biases for low false positive, high you know, assurance that it actually is a real issue because I don't want to have to gen more false positives. But as we're doing customized testing uh, for security in their build pipelines, we're shipping them now over into either, uh, st well, usually Stackstorm because it does a great bit of eventing, and we can take it from Stackstorm and dump it into ThreadFix. So the essence is whatever now we're starting to add into build pipelines that aren't sort of these separate uh, outside the normal dev uh, spectrum, those are getting moved into our same pipeline. And we've got a couple POCs going on now, and we'll do this more through the course of 2016. So the developers are pretty much writing some of their own ABCs that they worry about making Yes. As part of it, in, in a couple of those POC cases. And we have a couple, I mean, it's such a range. Oh my God, we have such a range. We have stuff that's auto scaling on Amazon, and we have 10 year old, 20 year old classic ASP. So, like, <laughs> I hate to make concrete statements because we have the range. Um, but for those progressive ones that are actually DevOps shops and have these kind of build pipelines, yes, we're starting to do POCs where we bundle in a couple very kind of uh, very specific testing that, that then can shoot into our pipeline and get part of the process. Uh, to be, I'm going to be bluntly honest with you, which I'm really good at, we haven't even messed with those old guys because they're just hard to do. I mean, like, I'm not worried about doing a build automation for those guys yet because i got so many other people that have build automation already that I need to chew through before I even look at those old guys. I'm imagining, hopefully, if, if God smiles upon me, some of those old guys will die <laughs> <laughs> while I'm doing the new guys. <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for. We'll see. Like, I don't know. Um, but that's that's kind of our work for this year is to try to get into more build pipelines because we kind of we got our stuff together for our group and now we're trying to reach into devs and get even earlier upstream, which is one of the reasons why we concentrated on static as well because that's much more early, early SDLC stage. Oh, and I love this quote by Deming: Sp uh, op uh, "Spending time optimizing anything other than the critical resource is an illusion. Right? You have to find that one bottleneck that's really holding you back and optimize that because if you don't do that, you're just creating a bigger." Uh, you're either running a system dry or creating a bigger uh, queue in front of whatever the real bottleneck is. So for me, it's the personnel and AppSec that are really the critical resource, right? I, I, raise your hand in here if you have too many AppSec people and you wish they'd all go away, right? Like, oh, gee, no hands, right? Like, the, the ratios will never be in our favor. So what do we do about that? Like, I'm trying to and we're trying to automate everything that doesn't require a human brain. And actually, myself and another person on the AppSec team went meta for pretty much all of 2015 and just wrote tooling to make our guys go faster. That's all I did last year. I did no assessments whatsoever. It was all tooling. I did, well, I did a lot of consultative work. But really, my day-to-day -day work was like, what can I write and automate and script and set up so that I hand a guy everything he needs to start his testing? Right? Done. Or how can I get results, you know, converted from format one to format two so they go into thread fix and it all just works, right? That was all of my work and another guy's work last year. Um, this has been awesome. Consistency's way up. We have an awesome ability to track our work status, which has been really fantastic when you get the, hey, it's, you know, this important marketing thing is going to launch today and we want you to drop everything and get this assessed right away. We're like, cool, now because everything's in bag of holding, I can say that's great. If you're going to take these three people off what they're working on now, we're not going to do these other things. And I'm like, are you cool with that? And we can actually have conversations about the cost of those decisions accurately with management, and that's been a huge boon to us. Because now people go, oh, well, that other thing's really important too, and so is that, oh, well, maybe only put one guy on this. Okay, cool, we can do that. And we have metrics now we can tell you, oh, a manual assessment takes about a week. Uh, check marks on loading takes a day, whatever it is. Right? We can tell you how long these things take because we're tracking them. Right? It's all in bag of holding. Um, we've definitely increased the workflow through the system. I have some numbers in a minute. We've usually increased visibility and metrics so much so that I'm probably going to spend the first half of this year doing me more metrics automation because it's almost like crack. Like we actually started giving metrics out and people were like, God, we want more and can you slice it this way and what about that and I want to buy a line of business and I want to buy the top 10 most scary apps and we're having to slice and dice this in all sorts of different ways. So really this first half of 2016 for me is going to be doing tons of metrics and doing things like being able to have dashboarding in ways that people can sort of a la carte serve themselves metrics. Because we've been producing them on a usually a monthly or quarterly cadence and then handing them out. But they want them like now, now, now. So I'm going to give them a way to get them now. And that they get them now. I don't give them to them now. 
<laughs> um, and this has definitely reduced the dev team friction with AppSec. It's been fantastic. Particularly the Jira thing has been great. That's, if you're not doing that now, like work on that big time. That's huge, huge, huge bonus. So let's talk about intake, right? This is the first impression. Um, and if you think about the apps coming into the AppSec team, right, it's gonna be an existing app. It might be a brand new app. It might be a, a uh, previously tested app, or it's an application who's had findings that need to be retested. Those are sort of the four big categories of apps that we came up with. Um, and one of the things we've done in our service request is we ask for data once. So if you are a new, a new app that we've never seen before, we're gonna say, what are you? What's your platform? Are you, you know, your Java, your JBoss, your whatever? Let's get all that metadata about you that kind of makes our job a little bit easier. And we'll ask you the first time. The next time you come back to Bag of Holding and ask, and say, who are you? Oh, I'm this app? We will say, oh, you told us last time you are Java and JBoss. And because the old system was asking the same metadata questions every single time, and it was driving the PMs crazy, because they're like, oh, dear God, the 40 questions, right? Um, and we actually did a little bit of clever tailoring of questions to what the app is as well. So we kind of dynamically do that instead of having the laundry list by committee of questions for the app developers, or the PMs, usually. Um, I talk about that, I talk about that, yeah. Yeah, and then we drop the, the, the apps into different categories based on what they are. We have a four-tier risk system at Pearson um, that we drop them into based on that metadata. And then the middle, or the uh, testing area, where we, we're using Stack to them to do a lot of eventing. Like I said, I've got some more slides on that later. And then we just kind of a la carte these tests. What we did is we created four tiers based on risk and some other criteria, and based on your tier, you get more or less of this middle, right? If you're an internal app that five people use and we really don't care about you, you may only get the app scan once a year and we're done with you, like, don't matter. If you're the high profile app that we're doing a major launch on and everyone's looking at, you get the full gamut and a manual test and a threat model and the whole nine, right? It just depends. But it allows us to a la carte all of these. And really 2016 for us is gonna be doing even more work about handing and automating and doing better profiling of the apps, because that's an area where we're still fairly manual. Like getting a decent app scan profile is usually a run or two with some tweaking, and then you have a, a reusable good profile for that app and app scan, let's say, or whatever the tool is. Um, the nice thing then, we can parallel, parallelize all this stuff, right? We can, whatever tools we need to do, we can run them. They, they're all parallelizable. All this stuff is designed, or we've written code to take the results and dump them directly into ThreadFix, so the minute they finish, we have the results. There's no sort of waiting or make sure you upload. We just automate that junk. Um, with the exception of obviously manual testing, they have to manually upload them, go figure. And then the focus is really, s is, um, our focus, particularly in the tooling of the last year, was on setup. I want everything set up as easy as possible for whoever's actually doing that activity, right? So if you're doing a manual test, I will hand you the URL, the creds, if you're allowed or not to do pre-prod or prod, when the testing window is, I'll give you all the metadata you need as a tester to know when and how you start testing, right? So you don't have to come in and ask the PM, what, who I, who's my point of contact? All that junk is handed to you as one unit, as part of a test. Yes? Right now it's on the dev teams. Yeah, it's totally on the dev teams. We don't do any of that. We, well, the, the only interaction is we get blessing or not to test certain environments. Like you can test prod, you can't test prod. You can test UA, you can't test UA, right? We have those kind of things, but actually setting up and maintaining those is the application owner's problem. Yeah. Yes, that's done by ThreadFix, actually, when it imports them. Ah, um, it's in the next slide, but I'll go ahead and talk about it now. Well, I'll talk, yeah, hey, you asked, I'll t answer. Um, ThreadFix will normalize them into a five point high, or yeah, let's see, critical high, medium, info low, whatever. Um, but it has an ability to filter and say, I think the info for CWE 75 from check marks, it says it's a high, I think it's a low. And you can actually tweak those custom by scanner type and so you can sort of nudge them into the criticality you believe they should be, not what the scanner says. Uh, not with the manuals because of the, I mean, they're, they're literally a manual upload. 
So there's not a way to do that. But there, there are guys, if they really are off the reservation, I can go poke them. <laughs> right? So <laughs> that's not been a problem. Yeah. Ah. Ooh, that's awesome, but no. <laughs> that's a great idea, but no. It doesn't, it nudges everything into CWEs as it's, you know, lingua franca for vulnerabilities inside of ThreadFix. And then, like I, like I said, it does the normalization of the, you know, critical to info, and then we can nudge them, but we lose it. That's a great, that's a great thing. Uh, yeah, adding the, the uh, CVSS, like environmental and all those other factors into ThreadFix so that you could actually have that carried through. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. We have a denim person in the back who maybe we'll talk to Dan about that later. That's a great, great idea. Um, let's settle that stuff. Oh, and then I, this is just about integrating with others, and this is really our, our work for this year, is taking the results from different build pipelines, and I've already sort of talked about this, pushing them directly into ThreadFix, using things like Gauntlet or other automated tools, SSLIs, what have you, to, to run them actually in the build process and then ship those just back into our pipeline, right? Yes? Oh, interesting. Um, we haven't seen that happen before, but we do have a, I'll talk about later, we have a chat bot that we use. Um, so we're doing some of the, the chat opsy stuff. I haven't seen dev teams ask for that yet, to be totally honest with you. Um, y yes, in a formal sense. Now, if they're running their own build in Jenkins, they can go look at those results right off of Jenkins. Because the way we've been integrating them is we just run normal, you know, red green, and then then we have a little bit of glucose to ship those into our pipeline into ThreadFix and go. They still, they still have access to it. We don't really. The, the big key is we don't hold them accountable until later on in the SDLC. They can get early results and then choose when they want to act upon them. Is is our is our real end goal. And then we're not, no, not perfect with it, but we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, yes, and obviously, you know, choose tools that make sense for your org. And then the deliver section of the pipeline, the tail end of it, right? This is where we're using ThreadFix as our source of truth, as I've talked about. It does dedupe and consolidate findings, which is super, super handy. So if AppScan and Zap find the same cross-site scripting, that's one finding, not two, um, which nice reduces the numbers of, of reporting. It does normalization of the scanner info, which is really nice for metrics because I can now pull out normalized stuff. Um, and then, it, like we talked about earlier, it pushes, um, it pushes issues into bug trackers. It has a REST interface. I wrote some Go code called TF Client. Another guy at Pearson wrote a Python um, library to talk to the REST interface. It's a fairly sane REST interface, so it's quite nice. Like, automation with thread fixes is, is pretty well easy to do, right? And this is where we touch point with a lot of different teams, right? This is where we're pushing out metrics for the CISO org on their monthly meetings. The dev groups get their different uh, metrics pushed out on a monthly and quarterly basis. All this kind of happens in the, in the delivery portion. So this is sort of the intake is where they first see us and out the delivery section is where we're actually interacting with our sort of constituency. So why do we like AppSec pipelines? Well, they'd allow us super, super, super visibility into work in progress. So it's something that I've rarely had in the various shops that I've been at. Like we know, if I log into Bo, if I VPN and logged into Bo, I could tell you, these people are working on these things right now. Here are the four we have queued. Here's how busy this guy is. Here's what's scheduled for next week. It's all there. Um, and it's all laid out very neatly. So that's fantastic. Um, we've been able to now sort of get some reasonable numbers on how long it takes to do these things. Um, which I, I mean, I've done this for a while. I can, from my hip, give you an idea what they are, but we actually have real numbers, which is nice. Um, particularly real numbers at where we're working. <laughs> um, uh, average statistic, te uh, static test tests, et cetera. Our ins consistency is through the roof. It's crazy. Um, we've been able to reallocate people very easily now because, like I said, those cost decisions can be real blatant with management. Okay, you want everybody on this, that's great, but these things aren't going to get done. Are you cool with that, right? And now we can actually have that conversation accurately. Um, each step is well-defined, and it's been flexible enough. We have a range of people in our team, from some very senior people to some very junior people. Um, and we can kind of plug them in where they fit, which is also good, because unfortunately, I'm sure you guys don't have all senior people, right? You have people that are learning and people that aren't, you know, are teaching, um, and, and a range in between. And so this has been really nice to allow us sort of to fit in people 
where they make sense in terms of their skill level and maturity. Yes? How hard are you writing? Oh, can I, be, can I be really awful and say I've been writing the code that does it but not looking at it? Lee does all of our stuff and he would know that answer and I don't off the top of my head. So I don't want to lie to you. I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> it's not instantaneous. Oh, no, no. Yes? Oh, that's a great point. I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I completely dropped that. The way that we're handling that for criticalities, but there's two dimensions to it. So it's your risk level one through four, and then there's the criticality of the finding, and we have sort of a matrix that says that we need a remediation plan in place in X period of time. So if you're a critical app with a critical vulnerability within 24 hours, I know this one, we have to have a remediation plan in place. Now, the, the real key there is plan in place because I might not know as a tester, I know it's critical, I know it's like an OMG kind of issue, but I have no idea what it's going to take on the backside to actually fix that. Is this like a two-line code change or is this like a refactor of the whole bloody thing? I don't know. The real big thing for us is to just have a remediation plan in place, not fixed. Because I've worked at places that must be fixed in X days, and that's like, you're pulling that out of your backside in all honesty. Like, there's no idea. You have no clue in most cases what it would really take to fix that. You just know how bad it is. So that gives you a nice sort of way to uh, interact with the dev teams and say, look, this is really bad. We need to get this fixed. Let's talk about timelines. And then at least I can get a date that I can drop into a calendar and go back and say, hey, you're one week out from saying you're having this critical fixed. Is it really fixed? How are we doing? Right? You can kind of nudge people in the right direction. Yeah. Is that necessarily the case for you or the dev teams? The dev teams, well, the remediation plan is on both of us, honestly. Really, at the end of the day, I guess if it didn't happen, it'd fall on our back. So we're pretty motivated to like sit down with these people. But without, with the benefits we've seen over the course of this year, we have enough cred points with management that we haven't had trouble getting people to come to the table. And a lot of it is because we're not saying, you must fix it in seven days arbitrarily. We're saying, look, problem, let's figure out how long it's going to take. I just need a date from you, right? Yes? Yeah, no, oh, we definitely do, and those would trump our SLAs. But we, we, we wanted to make a generic thing that fit all, and then obviously there's exceptions to that. Yeah, get it done. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. yeah, we, we, we will pull that cord if we have to, but for us making a generic fits everybody SLA, that matrix worked really well, and then we just handle the exceptions as they come up. And Bo, actually, I didn't mention this, has a, I don't know how many, uh, Adam put a ridiculous number of regulations in there. So you can actually tag applications with the regulatory requirements. So we can actually know, oh, there is PCI in this thing. Therefore, our SLAs don't, you don't count. Based yeah. Based on that yeah, the, the PCI is going to supersede the normal SLA. You know, so developers telling me that I'm going to fix this doesn't really help. Well, that yeah. Good. Yep. Oh, so the other reason we like uh, AppSec pipelines is a 5X. So our numbers, these are rough numbers. 2014, we did 44 assessments. Um, 2015, we did 200 assessments. And I have a tilde in front of it because honestly, we didn't start collecting metrics till March when we really launched the pipeline. So I'm guessing we had about 200. Officially, we have 190 some odd, I think, actually in bag of holding or in Threadfix, but we missed three months of data. So we haven't, we haven't, we're just now actually going back and counting everything. Um, but uh, we're going to end up right at 200. The other things to note, right, is that we actually lost people in 2015. We lost three and a half people, <laughs> roughly. We, one guy got put half time on something else, so he, we only get half of his time. One senior guy left and, you know, found exciting opportunities elsewhere. And we lost a couple other people. So we actually lost people and did more. So if you do this math, it's like 4.5, 4.6, 4.7. 4 I rounded up. Like, I'll be honest with you, I'll round it up because five sounds really good. Yes? I'm sorry? The team with Bag of Holding is, tw at, the t at the peak it was 12. The AppSec team was 12 people. We don't, we very limited given access to Bag of Holding because really that's our, like what's going on in our shop. And although people have asked like, oh, I'd like to be, have a look in Bag of Holding. I'm like, what do you want to know from Bag of Holding? Because it's got a REST API and I'll produce you a report. Just because it, it we can be 
the comments can be honest in big holding, to, <laughs> for nothing else, right? This team is a real, we all allowed to work with, can live in bag of holding and we don't have to worry about somebody seeing it, if nothing else. Um, but yeah, we've had crazy good luck. So let's talk about bag of holding, right? Here it is on GitHub, you can go download it, it's a Django app, it's pretty nice. It manages our AppSec program and hunts, holds all of our applications, all of the engagement tracking, it does some rudimentary reports. Um, it allows comments on application or engagement or activity, so you can kind of leave breadcrumbs if you have to do like a handoff, like if we have to take Joe off of it and put Sally on it, Joe can leave comments of like, hey, I've tested the, you know, the shopping cart but not the profile page or whatever. Um, we have a data classification plan and PII data, so you can actually list what PII data you have and what classification, Pearson has a data classification standard, so we wired that in there. Um, we actually can, like I talked about, we take how long it takes to do the various activities. Uh, really nice historical knowledge of past assessments. Who's ever had like management come in and says, when was the last time you looked at app X? And you go, huh? I remember that name sometime last year, maybe, uh, let me look. Right, now it's just in bag of holding. Um, we use it as a credential repository, so when we're doing engagements and we assign somebody to go test, you know, the, whatever the dev instance of whatever app, the creds for that app are in there so we can log in one of our guys can log in, knows he is that app, and automatically go get the creds just to sort of smooth testing along. And then we have a ton of environmental details, and I have, I have screenshots. So here's an example team dashboard with not too terribly many people in it. Aaron Weaver's twice, this must be test data, obviously. Um, but we have a dashboard that says here are the activities by user, here's the open engagements. We don't have any empty engagements. An empty engagement is an engagement with no activities or people assigned and then unassigned activities, so we gotta figure out who's gonna do this Bravo app threat model. Ooh, 15 minutes, wow, I gotta cook, thank you. I'm running long. Um, this is a horribly badly visible screenshot of the application repository. The key feature is we have a ton of metadata around them, and you can search by all of it, by lifecycle platform, audience, technologies, all of that's filterable and tagged. So you can do crazy sorting of, of all of the application repository, which has been silly useful for us, because we have 400 or so in here now. I don't remember exactly last time I looked. Here's some sort of basic reporting on, on the status of an application. So here's metrics out of thread fix. It's using MySQL and PHP and Apache, all this kind of metadata on a, of a quick picture of the status of an app. Um, here's another one, Defect Dojo that started when I was at Rackspace and continued and is now actually in the public domain. Um, this is another one that's up on GitHub. Um, I think it's Apache licensed, I can't remember. It's very similar to uh, Bag of Holding. It also does some reporting and it has some uh, way to import manual testing, but it also has the idea of engagements um, and some nice metrics, it's pretty cool. Uh, number two of the three ways, wow, I'm gonna go fast, was improve feedback, so open yourself to upstream and downstream information. Uh, this was a tweet I made a while back, I guess it was back in April, because um, I was just sick and tired of logging into the nth web console to get out frickin' data that I had to get with the frickin' website and not in an automated fashion, so in my rage I, I tweeted this and hope a lot of people bug their vendors about this. That if I can do it with the UI, I never bloody want to log into that thing, I want a UI. I mean, an REST API, so I can go write some code that pulls out what I need and I don't have to log in. Like, I've written my last screen scraper, I'm done. <laughs> Um, and this is a chatbot I spoke about earlier that we call Will. Um, we're using Stackstorm to do the eventing portion of it, and then the Will is the name of the Python bot that does uh, hip chat. So you can ask uh, the AppSec bot for help, and it'll tell you the various things it can do, including fun things like, I want advice on cross-site scripting. And it'll say, oh, well, this is cross-site scripting. Here's a link to our actual library where we actually have more details on cross-site scripting. We're uh, international, we're on everywhere except for um, Antarctica. Pearson has offices on every continent except for Antarctica. So we're 24-7, 365, and I don't wanna be that. So if we're not around, and it happens to be we don't have somebody in that time zone in the AppSec team, they can at the very least ask HipChat for some baseline advice, right? That was kind of the motivator for this. Um, you can actually, if you're in our private channel, you can actually get stats on what an application has currently in ThreadFix. Like, what, what does App X have? Oh, it's got no criticals, no highs, a medium, and three lows, right? You can also create an application, which creates an application profile in ThreadFix and Bag of Holding. 
You get summary metrics for the entire AppSec program, like how are we doing, how many apps have we done, all that kind of metadata we can pull out. Mostly driven by management drive-bys saying, hey, how are we doing? You like pop up into your hip chat window and run a little quick question to the bot and you can say, oh, well, boss man, we have doodlulu, right, done. Easy. Um, the other really cool thing is it's, oh yeah, this one, is we did this for check marks where you can actually ask the bot in our private channel to set up a check marks for the it dash A is for the application icon master. It's part of core, which is a business unit. Here is its link to its repository. AppSec bot will take that information, hand it over to Stackstorm. Stackstorm has a predefined workflow to actually reach into check marks, set up that application in there. If that application isn't in bag of holding and thread fix, it automatically adds them there. And then it sets up a weekly as a default poll where we'll pull your source code out of the repo, run a scan, and generate results. And then I wrote some code that take those results and dump them into ThreadFix. So within a minute, we get automatic reoccurring weekly static analysis. Talking to the bot. Yes? Uh, 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 right now, I'm, not, I'm just not worried about that, to be bluntly honest with you. It, it pulls the, by default, it pulls master from Git of their code base. So if they're working in a branch or something, we won't see that. But right now, this is much better than what we had before. So I'm happy. <laughs> and we'll figure out a way to find that out. And then we'll, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> no, there's a consistent branching scheme for every project. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, and then the third part of the three ways of DevOps, right, is continual experimentation and learning. Um, and this is, I think, really fundamentally that what saved us is the fact that me and, and Adam went meta for an entire year. And we just like, what's the problem? What do we need to fix? What's hurting people? Where are people losing lots of time? And let's go fix those and automate those. Oh, yeah. Failures only serve to limit the scope of what must be tried to succeed. Um, and we've had some things that we tried that were absolutely awful, and we kicked them to the curb, and we tried something else, right? That's what you do. That's like, how do you know? Well, we're going to try and see what happens. And a lot of our stuff didn't work. The stuff that worked, we kept. Oh, and I love this quote, right? I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And I really think because we had the pipeline and we had the consistency of the steps and how we did things, it really made us get quick because we kind of knew, oh, I got a manual assessment. This is where I go. This is what I do. There's no questions, right? There's no emails back and forth. All that junk goes away. Uh, myself and Aaron Weaver um, created a project on OWASP called the OWASP AppSec Pipeline. Um, this is where we're trying to collect people of similar minds and get some business cases and how people have done this because I know what worked at Pearson worked really great at Pearson. It will not work where you work because you're different. Um, but the concepts will work, right? The concepts of what you need to do and how you need to do it work and I think are universal, but the specifics aren't, right? Because your devs, your sh the way your shop works will be completely different. So we're trying to gather a lot of information here so that people who are in this situation can actually learn from each other and have some nice knowledge sharing. Um, for example, we started working on getting an idea of different tool integrations, where they fit inside the timeline. How can you use them, right? What's, I need to worry about storing. Where can I store stuff? I needed to worry about deploying. Here's some tools that I can use in the deploy time frame. Um, we're taking some of that, and I have 10 minutes. So let's see if I can do this really quick. So here is a uh, site running on my local host. This isn't on the internet yet. Hopefully, it'll be on the internet next week. Um, but this is an AppSec pipeline toolbox, and this is where we want to kind of gather that metadata about various and sundry tools and post them online so that you can, let's see if I can get my pointer. For example, this is extremely rough. Like, here is Defect Dojo, and here is some information about it, of what's useful. And this is actually coming, what's, what's cool about this is this is actually coming straight out of uh, this markdown in this GitHub. So... Oh, duh, I'm not on the internet right now. So you're not going to, ah, poo. Well, oops, demo fail. But the idea is that I will have all of the tools in GitHub, and if you are a vendor or a practitioner and you want to update or add information or add a tool, it's just a PR request on Git. We'll take it in, we'll add it in. Every hour, by default, the server we're using called Caddy pulls GitHub and pulls the latest into a directory, and so boom, done. Like, you do a PR, we accept your PR, you're on the internet, done. I should have this up hopefully next week. I'm close. I POC'd it last night. <laughs> and the GitHub stuff works, so cha-ching. I just need to make this page look pretty and not white. But I want to make sure I could pull Markdown and, and mark it up, and it works. 
So, key takeaways, like auto, look for paper cuts and automate them. Like you need to have somebody go at least partially meta um, because you will get a huge increase in workflow and you'll actually start to see benefits. Like I said, we're I think the golden children at Pearson right now because we have been silly productive. Um, and find and figure out whatever your workflow is and normalize that and make it kind of an easy button as much as you can. That was a huge boon for us. And whatever system you create, make sure that it grows organically. Um, and if you can, like learn to talk dev and speak their language because those are the people that are going to end up fixing the things we find, right? So like being rude and ugly to them is probably not the best way to motivate them to find them. Sometimes you do have to use the stick, but I prefer to like start with the carrot. And thanks, and I will answer any questions you have. These are, these are ways to get a hold of it.